In this video, we're going to cover an introduction to pharmacology and introduce you to one of the fundamental concepts, which is pharmacodynamics. We're going to break down what a drug is, how drugs produce their effects on the body, and introduce you to the different types of drug targets. And then in later pharmacodynamics lectures, we're going to expand on these topics. All right. So first of all, what is a drug? In pharmacology, a drug is a chemical substance that when administered to a living organism produces a biological effect. Drugs can be used for therapeutic purposes to treat diseases, or they can be used for non-therapeutic purposes such as recreational or experimental use. This also includes the caffeine in your coffee <laughs> on an ice latte now. And it also includes experimental tools that are used in researching diseases or finding new therapeutic treatments. Now, medicine is what we usually refer to as a drug that is used to treat, cure, or alleviate a disease's symptoms. These are what we refer to as therapeutic drugs or therapeutic agents. And a lot of medicines actually contain more than one active ingredient. So there will be a lot of other things in a therapeutic formulation. So it may contain other substances such as stabilizers or solvents. For example, a brand of medication used to treat high blood pressure might contain two different types of blood pressure lowering drugs in a single pill. Okay. Another example that we might consider a drug might be something like a venom or a toxin because these substances produce a biological effect on a living organism. So a poison is a substance that causes a harmful effect on the body. But the thing is, the difference between a drug or medicine and a poison might be in the dose. If a substance is taken at therapeutic levels, it's very safe and effective. But if taken in overdose, it can lead to dangerous outcomes such as liver damage and failure. And we're going to break this down in later lectures when we cover concentration response relationships and the relationship between the dose of a drug that's given and the effect it has. So that's the definition of a drug. The question now is, how are drugs classified? Drugs can be classified in different ways based on their chemical structure, mechanism of action, which is how the drug achieves its biological effects, okay, so how the drug does what it does. For example, going back to lowering blood pressure, how does it lower blood pressure? Another way is based on therapeutic use. So what is the drug designed to do? For example, drugs can be classified as depressants, analgesics, or antibiotics based on their effects on the body. Okay, so then how do you name drugs? Because many drugs have multiple different names. There are three main systems for naming drugs. We have chemical, generic, and proprietary. Chemical names are based on the drug's chemical structure and are often complex and difficult to remember. They are primarily used by chemists and researchers, so it's not really used when talking about the medications that are given to patients. Next are generic names, which are simpler names given to drugs by regulatory agencies once they have been approved for use. These names are not owned by any particular company and are used by multiple manufacturers. Now, it's really important for these approved names to be different from each other. This is to avoid confusion with other drugs that are already approved and on the market because we don't want to prescribe one drug to a patient who ends up being given another drug that has similar sound or spelling to it but has a completely different effect. And then we have proprietary names, also known as brand names. Okay, so these are created by drug companies and are used to market their products. These names are protected by trademarks and are unique to a particular product. Essentially, the naming systems have different characteristics and uses. Chemical names are important for research and development while generic names are important for prescribing and dispensing drugs, and proprietary names are important for marketing and brand recognition. Let's go through an example. So here we have an example for a very commonly used drug. If you're a medicinal chemist, then it will tell you a lot about the drug, but if you aren't, then not really. Now, if we were to use a generic name or a trade name, most people would be familiar with the drug. The generic name for this compound is ibuprofen. 
Ibuprofen is the approved name suggested by the manufacturer and approved by the regulatory authority to use and describe the chemical entity. If you aren't familiar with ibuprofen, then you are likely to be familiar with at least one of the trade or brand names for this drug. One of the trade names is Nurofen, another is Advil. It's the same chemical entity, but it is manufactured and marketed by two different pharmaceutical companies. You can see the differences between chemical name, generic name, and trade name. All right, so we've covered what a drug is and the different systems that are used to classify drugs. Let's now subtract complexity and start to look at how drugs produce their effects within the body. We're going to introduce pharmacodynamics, which is the study of how drugs produce their biological effects and how drugs will affect the different systems of the body. It involves understanding the interactions between drugs and their target receptors, enzymes, and other molecules in the body, and how these interactions lead to changes in cellular function, organ function, and ultimately the overall response of the organism. But before we start breaking this down, why is this important? Because there's no point in going through this without actually asking what our purpose is here. So why is pharmacodynamics important? Well, because understanding pharmacodynamics is important for the development of safe and effective drugs. By studying how drugs interact with the body, we can predict their effects, optimize their dosing regimes, and minimize their potential for adverse reactions. Okay? So then, how does a drug exert its effects on the body? It does this by modifying existing processes, including physiological or biochemical processes. A lot of drugs exert their effects via specific chemical interactions, so covalent bonds, hydrophobic interactions, or electrostatic, okay, with particular molecular targets. Drug targets can be proteins, enzymes, receptors, or other cellular components, which we'll break down later in this lecture. So the drug is going to bind to the target molecule, which then modifies the function of its molecular target to produce a biological effect. So it'll either activate or inhibit its function, leading to a physiological response. The ability of a particular drug to bind to its molecular target is determined by both the structure of the drug and the structure of the molecular target. Okay, and the type of interactions formed between the drug and its target is important as well. One thing I want to point out is that there are drugs that produce their effects on the body by acting on simple physical or chemical processes. These are called non-selective interactions or effects. What this means is that these drugs aren't interacting with a specific molecular target, but instead are modifying a more general physical or chemical process. Let's go through some examples. A great example are antacids like calcium carbonate or magnesium hydroxide, which are commonly used for indigestion. These don't have a particular molecular target, but rather they modify a chemical process within the body. They work by neutralizing stomach acid through a simple chemical reaction. So they don't target any specific molecule or pathway. They're a weak base that acts on the acidic environment of the stomach because your stomach produces large amounts of hydrochloric acid, which aids in the digestion of food. So the hydrochloric acid in the stomach will react directly with the antacid, and therefore the acid will become neutralized, so you will end up with a reduction in the acidity of the stomach. It's pretty cool, okay? So those are antacids. Another example of a type of drug that exerts its effect by modifying a non-selective process are osmotic agents. An example is osmotic laxatives, which you may know are used for the treatment of constipation, okay? But they're also used for the preparation of particular GI procedures, such as a colonoscopy. So what these osmotic laxatives do is they're going to draw water into the colon, which increases the bulk and softness of stool, promoting bowel movements. This effect is not due to any specific interaction with a drug target, but rather to the physical process of water movement. Okay, so these laxatives contain molecules that are difficult for the GI tract to absorb. So there's going to be a higher concentration of these molecules that stay within the GI tract. So there's going to be an increase in soil concentration inside the GI tract, which then stimulates osmotic activity because water follows solute. So what happens is it's going to cause water to move from the gut capillaries into the inside of the GI tract. Okay, so that's how laxatives work. 
Both antacids and osmotic agents, in this case osmotic laxatives, are examples of drugs that have non-selective effects on the body. So in summary, some drugs can exert their effects through non-selective interactions with simple chemical and or physical processes without targeting any specific molecule or pathway. All right, so it's good to be aware of these types of drugs. Let's now move on and break down the different types of drug targets and how different drugs affect these targets. All right, now the majority of drugs produce their effects via selective interactions with proteins. So they will bind to a protein and alter the function of that protein. We refer to the site where a drug binds to exert its action as a molecular target. Although protein molecules aren't always the molecular targets of drugs, they just make up the majority of them. And we can divide these protein targets for drug action into four main groups. We have ion channels, carrier proteins, enzymes, and receptors. Each of these targets play plays an important role in cellular function and can be targeted by drugs to achieve therapeutic effects. So again, drugs can enhance the activity of a protein, inhibit it, or modify its normal function. So let's go through each of these four different types of proteins and use examples of how drugs can act on that type of target, starting with ion channels. Ion channels are membrane proteins that allow the passage of ions such as sodium, potassium, and calcium across cell membranes. So they are formed by a single protein or a group of proteins that are embedded within the plasma membrane. These channels are really important in cell-to-cell -cell communication between excitable cells, so neurons, muscles, even cells that are involved in secretion. So when ion channels are open, they're going to create an open pore or passage between the extracellular fluid and the inside of the cell or intracellular fluid. And they're characterized by having specificity or selectivity for different types of ions. So for example, there are channels that are selective for sodium ions, potassium ions, or calcium ions. And the channel name will depend on the selection for the different types of ions. So a channel that is selective or only allows sodium to pass will be referred to as the sodium channel. And what determines whether an ion can move through the open pore is influenced by the charge of the ion as well as the size of the molecule. Okay? Now, ion channels can exist in different types of states. So they can either be in an open or closed state. And these channels are regulated to make sure that they are open or closed in response to different types of physiological signals. Because cells such as neurons and muscle cells rely on ion channels to create the appropriate signals that allow those cell types to do their job effectively. Okay, so we want to open or close these channels appropriately. So this is known as gating of channels or channel gating. So the opening or closing of ion channels is determined by channel gating. Okay, Ion channel gating can be regulated by various types of stimuli, but we're going to go through two examples, voltage gated channels and ligand gated channels. Starting with voltage gated channels, these are regulated by changes in the cell's membrane potential. So think your neurons and your muscle cells. Remember that membrane potential refers to the difference in electrical charge between the inside and the outside of the cell. Resting membrane potential is the voltage difference across the cell membrane when cells are at rest. So with voltage-gated channels, in this case we have sodium channels, these have two gates. There's an activation gate and an inactivation gate. So the inactivation gate here can be described as a ball and chain-like structure. Okay, so these channels have three states or conformations. First, it can be closed but capable of opening. Okay, so the inactivation gate here is open because the ball is just hanging free. It can be completely open and activated, so both gates are open. Or it can be closed and not capable of opening. It's inactivated. This is the inactivation state. So voltage-gated ion channels will be influenced by whether they're in an open state or a closed state, okay? So some of these channels will be stimulated to open, 
will be stimulated to open by depolarization or hyperpolarization. Any changes in the membrane potential will determine whether the channel is open or closed. All right, that's voltage-gated ion channels. The other type are ligand-gated channels. These are also called ionotropic receptors. So these are large protein complexes. These are ion channels that open directly in response to ligand binding. So they are regulated by the binding of chemical ligands. A great example are neurotransmitters that are involved in synaptic transmission. Once a neurotransmitter binds, this will cause the channel to change shape and it's going to open up allowing ions from the extracellular fluid to enter. So here we have the nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. And right now, this channel is in its closed state. So it's not allowing any ions to pass through the channel. Now, when the ligand acetylcholine binds to the channel, it will change the conformation of the channel and open up. And it's going to allow ions, in this case, sodium ions, to flow into the cell and down its concentration gradient. Okay, so these are the two main types of gating channels, voltage gating and ligand gating. There are also some other types of ion channels that are regulated by other types of physical changes, such as stretch sensitive channels and temperature sensitive channels. Okay, so these are just the two main types. Okay, now, there are multiple different ways in which drugs can affect the activity of ion channels. So drugs that target ion channels can either block or enhance their activity, altering the flow of ions and impacting cellular signaling and communication. So some drugs will directly alter ion channels by binding to different sites on the ion channel, modifying the state of the channel, okay? So a drug can bind to the channel in such a way that it prevents the ions from moving through the channel. Examples of drugs that target ion channels include local anesthetics, which block sodium channels and reduce pain sensation. But let's look at a more specific example by looking at drugs that affect voltage-gated sodium channels. If you've seen the Action Potentials lecture, we talked about how important these channels are in generating action potentials in cells like neurons and muscle cells. These sodium channels are usually closed in the resting state, and when the neuron depolarizes, that triggers the opening of these channels. What happens when the channels are open? It's going to allow sodium ions to flow into the cell, which allows for the continuation of action potential, of the action potential. So one example of a drug that directly affects voltage-gated sodium channels is tetrodotoxin. This drug directly blocks the channel here. So this is a neurotoxin that's found in a range of different marine creatures and causes inhibition of neurotransmission, which leads to a loss of sensation and in higher concentrations, paralysis. So tetrodotoxin blocks these channels, which then inhibit ion movement through the channel directly. So it can't pass through. Ions can't pass through the channel. The thing is, it doesn't matter whether the channel is in the open state, the inactivated state, or the closed state, the actions of tetrodotoxin are the same. So its action is independent of the state of the channel. Now, there are also drugs that affect voltage-gated sodium channels and are dependent on the channel state for their action. An example is lignocaine, which is a type of anesthesia that works by binding to open or recently open channels in the nerves. So when neurons are firing frequently, there are more open or inactivated channels or inactive channels for lignocaine to bind to in those areas. This is important because it allows for more targeted anesthesia in these areas with more nerve activity, which is especially useful since sensory neurons increase their firing rate with the intensity of the stimuli causing them to fire. So lignocaine's interactions with these channels is use dependent, meaning it is more effective in areas with higher nerve activity. Okay, so essentially there are different ways drugs can interact with ion channels, either directly, such as with tetrodotoxin, or dependent on their channel state, like lignocaine. All right, that's ion channels. Let's now move on to the second type of protein target for drug action, which is another type of transport protein, carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are membrane proteins that transport molecules across cell membranes. Here's the thing, 
they don't form an open channel or pore between the inside and outside of the cell. What carrier proteins do is they take different conformation shape, okay, and shuttle the molecule from one side to the other. This process involves a series of changes in the structure of the carrier protein that influence its orientation towards the inside or outside of the cell, as well as the ability of different molecules to bind to it. So specifically, when a solute molecule needs to be transported across the membrane, it binds to the carrier protein, causing a conformational change. So here we have the molecule, this cute as molecule that needs to be transported and the gate to the inside of the cell is closed, but open to the outside of the cell. And so this is going to flip, okay? This flips the carrier protein so that it is no longer open to the outside of the cell, but now open to the inside of the cell, so the gate is closed to the outside. So there's a conformational change here, okay? The shape is changing. So this change in conformation allows the solute molecule to move across the membrane and then eventually dissociating from the carrier protein inside the cell. It's pretty cool, right? Now, one key feature of carrier proteins is that they're never open to both sides of the membrane at the same time. This is because the solute molecule must bind to a specific site on the protein channel to be transported. And this also means that the carrier proteins can be subject to competition and potential saturation of the transport mechanism. Okay, so the binding affinity of the solute to the carrier protein is also affected by conformational changes in that protein structure. This means that the ability of different molecules to bind to a specific carrier protein can vary. All right, now carrier proteins can be classified in different ways. One method involves characterizing them by the type of molecule they transport, such as sodium, glucose, or potassium. There are also several types of carrier proteins, including uniport transporters that can only transport a single molecule, and co-transporters that can carry multiple types of molecules simultaneously or at the same time, such as sodium glucose co-transporters or sodium potassium co-transporters. Okay, If the co-transporters move the molecules in the same direction across the membrane, they are referred to as symport carriers. However, if the transport protein moves molecules in different directions, they are known as antiport carriers. So that's one method. Another method of characterizing carrier proteins is based on the energy source that powers the transport. Passive transport or facilitated diffusion occurs when molecules move down their concentration gradient without the need for external energy. It doesn't require any energy, whereas active transport involves the movement of molecules against their concentration gradient, which requires external energy such as ATP. Okay? So now that we've established what carrier proteins are, let's look at some examples. Let's look at how drugs can influence this process, can influence carrier proteins. So drugs that target carrier proteins can interfere with their ability to transport molecules, altering cellular metabolism and function. We're still looking at neurotransmission here. So we have the presynaptic terminal and the postsynaptic cell and we have a postsynaptic receptor right here. And when a substance binds, it will produce a response in the postsynaptic cell, okay? So remember what happens when an action potential reaches the axon terminal. It's going to stimulate the voltage-gated calcium channels to open, and calcium ions are going to flow into the synaptic knob where calcium triggers the release of neurotransmitters from the synaptic vesicles here, which contain dopamine, serotonin, and noradrenaline. So here, we have neurotransmitters being released at the synapse, where they can interact with their receptors to produce a response. But what we're truly focused on here is the reuptake process. These neurotransmitters are terminated, their actions are terminated when they are removed from the synapse, okay? So generally, the removal of the neurotransmitter occurs via reuptake into the presynaptic neuron via a carrier protein through the process of facilitated diffusion, okay? So reuptake is when the neurotransmitters are taken back up into the presynaptic neuron after they have been released into the synapse. Now, why is this process important? Why are we talking about this? Because reuptake helps 
it helps the regulation, it helps to regulate the duration and strength of neuronal signaling. It's important to the overall functioning of the nervous system. And there are several different drugs that can interfere with this process, and they do so by blocking the carrier proteins, okay? Because if you block the carrier proteins, what's going to happen? You will get less of the neurotransmitter that gets taken back up into the presynaptic neuron. And what happens, okay? So when this happens, what do we do? It means you've got more neurotransmitter present in the synapse, and therefore you're going to enhance the actions of that neurotransmitter. Because remember, the actions of the neurotransmitter are only terminated when they are removed from the synapse. So if we're blocking the reuptake protein, okay, this carrier protein here, we're going to be leaving neurotransmitters in the synapse, and therefore enhancing their activity. So let's go through two examples, including cocaine and fluoxetine. So first up, cocaine. So what cocaine does is it blocks the carrier proteins that are responsible for neurotransmitters such as dopamine and norepinephrine. So then it has a stimulatory effect on those neurotransmitters because these transmitters are going to stay in the synapse for longer, causing euphoria and all the other effects that cocaine has. So there's going to be a buildup of these neurotransmitters in the synapse, okay? So that's cocaine. On the other hand, fluoxetine is an example of a drug that is more selective for individual carrier protein mechanisms. What fluoxetine does is blocks the carrier protein that is responsible for the reuptake of serotonin into the nervous system. This is an example of a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, okay, which blocks the reuptake of serotonin and increases its availability. These drugs are one of the most commonly used in the treatment of depression, okay? So these are the different ways in which drugs can interfere with carrier proteins to influence the actions of neurotransmitters. Let's now move on to the next type of drug targets, enzymes. So recall that enzymes are biological catalysts. They speed up a reaction without being consumed by the reaction, and most enzymes are proteins. Enzymes are important for a whole range of biological processes. Their activity depends on their protein conformation, including primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary protein structures. If an enzyme is denatured, its catalytic activity is gone. Okay, So drugs that target enzymes can either enhance or inhibit their activity, altering cellular metabolism, neurotransmission, and function. Let's go through an example of a drug called nearstigmine that inhibits an enzyme involved in neurotransmission. So you may have heard of acetylcholine, okay? So acetylcholine is a neurotransmitter that's important in the peripheral and central nervous system. It's synthesized from acetyl-CoA and choline, catalyzed by choline acetyl transferase. Now, the actions of acetylcholine are terminated when acetylcholine is broken down, similar to what we've just spoken about. And it's broken down by an enzyme called acetylcholinesterase that is found in nerve terminals, where acetylcholine is released. Okay, so when acetylcholine is released, it can then diffuse across the synapse and bind to parasynaptic receptor proteins. So then this acetylcholine receptor opens up allowing ions to flow inside. So going back to acetylcholinesterase, it breaks down the acetylcholine into choline and acetate, inactivating that neurotransmitter because the actions of a neurotransmitter is terminated when it's removed from the synapse. So what we're doing here is we're going to break it down to choline and acetate. There are several different drugs that can target and inhibit this acetylcholinesterase. Okay, So different drugs can inhibit acetylcholinesterase and one example of a drug that inhibits acetylcholinesterase in a competitive or reversible manner is neostigmine. Okay, so neostigmine binds to and inhibits acetylcholinesterase. So then what happens when we inhibit the activity of this enzyme? Well, now we can't break down acetylcholine, and so we're going to end up with increased levels of acetylcholine at the synapse. So neostigmine is a drug that is involved in the treatment of myasthenia gravis, which is a neuromuscular disease that's characterized by a failure of transmission at the neuromuscular junction. Okay, And the main neurotransmitter at the junction is acetylcholine. So if we step back and think about that for a second, by preventing the breakdown of acetylcholine, we're going to increase the levels of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. 
And what's this going to do? It's going to enhance neuromuscular transmission. Okay, so that's neurostigmine. And we mentioned that this drug can bind to and inhibit this enzyme reversibly. But there are also drugs that do this irreversibly, which means we can't take it back, okay? And there's a name for this family of molecules that irreversibly inhibits this enzyme here. They are known as organophosphates. All right, so this is an example of how enzymes can be the cause of drug action. We're either enhancing or inhibiting the activity, altering its function. Okay, the last type we're going to look at are receptors. So these bad boys recognize and respond to the different types of chemical messengers that our body uses to communicate. They bind to specific signaling molecules such as hormones, neurotransmitters, and cytokines, and transmit signals into cells. So the effect of neurotransmitters, hormones, and other chemical mediators are controlled by receptors. So drugs that target receptors, again, can either enhance or block their activity, altering cellular signaling and function. And one common mechanism for influencing a receptor is through an activating drug, which is known as an agonist. An agonist is a drug that binds to and activates a receptor. We're going to talk about this in more detail in further pharmacodynamics lecture, okay? But just know an agonist is a drug that binds to and activates a receptor, whereas an antagonist is a drug that binds to the receptor but does not cause activation. It can bind to it, but it doesn't activate it. So when an agonist binds to a receptor, it's going to activate a signaling mechanism within the cell, and whichever signaling mechanism is activated will determine the cellular effects. Examples of drugs that target receptors include beta agonists, which activate beta adrenergic receptors and increase heart rate and airway dilation. And we also have antihistamines, which block histamine receptors and reduce allergic symptoms. We'll break down the four main types of receptors in another lecture, but for now, understand that receptors are a very diverse group of proteins and can mediate a whole range of different types of effects in the body, from quick responses like neurotransmission to much lower processes that are related to growth and development. Okay? All right. So we've covered a lot in this lecture. So to summarize it, okay, drugs can affect the four main types of molecular targets for drug action. We have ion channels, carrier proteins, enzymes, and receptors. By either enhancing or inhibiting their activity, or altering cellular signaling and function to achieve therapeutic effects. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist.